welcome the Asian Review. Our show today is Taiwan was never part of China. And our guest joining us via Skype from Melbourne, Australia is Dr. J. Bruce uh, Jacobs, Emeritus Professor at Monash University in Melbourne. Professor Jacobs and I became acquainted while we were both visiting scholars at the Institute of Taiwan History and Academia Sinica in Taiwan last year. He has a very long history of studying about Taiwan and a wide variety of publications about Taiwan, for example, 38 pages of them. Uh, welcome, uh, Bruce. It's great to have you with us today. Good to be with you, Bill. Great, great. Well, let's get right into it. Um, you, when well, you were at Academia Seneca, you uh, were working on a project and uh, wrote a paper called A History of Pre-Invasion Taiwan, which you also gave a very interesting talk about one day. Can you give us the high points of that? Okay. Um, I think that um, it's important to know that when you look at the history of Taiwan, that um, to, to study the real history of Taiwan is something that's only been free to do for about 20, 30 years, because the colonial government of Chiang Kai-shek and Chiang Jingguo uh, forbade um, real research about Taiwan. They had certain parameters that you had to agree to, and it turned out that they're all wrong. So basically, <laughs> what, so um, so many people in Taiwan and people overseas are now starting to relook at Taiwan. And in this paper, I argue there are sort of three historical periods for Taiwan, three large periods. The first is what I call the pre-invasion or the pre-colonial period, which goes from the beginning uh, right up to 1624. And from 1624 until 1988, there were six colonial regimes. By colonial regimes, I mean regimes that came in from the outside and ruled in the in the uh, interests of the outsiders. Could you name those just for the benefit of the audience who might not be familiar with them? Yes, I was going to. Oh, um, okay. The first, one, the first one is the Dutch uh, from 1624 to 1662. And during the same period, in this period of time, the Dutch were in quite some competition with the Spanish. And the Spanish, when the Dutch went to Taiwan, the Spanish set up a, a regime in northern Taiwan for part of that period. The third colonial regime was that of Zheng, the Zheng Zhenggong family, the Zheng family, which was led by a man named Koxinga, who was famous in East Asian history. But when he came to Taiwan, he died after within six months. And his family set up a regime that lasted till 1683, when they were defeated by the Manchus, who had taken over Taiwan in 1644. So 40 years later, there was an uprising in southern China that the Taiwan, the sort of independent Taiwan regime, set uh, joined in with the southern the southerners, and so the the Manchus decided they had to be conquered, and so the Manchus ran Taiwan from 1683 to 1895, when Taiwan was was separated from from the Manchu Empire and became part of the Japanese Empire. So, so the fourth regime was the Manchus, and I think it's important to say here the Manchus were not Chinese; they were foreigners, as far as the Chinese were concerned, and their empire was twice the size of the previous Ming Dynasty. Hmm. And then the Japanese from 1895 to 1945, and then from 1945, Chiang Kai-shek came across and took Taiwan. Uh, and it was the first time a Chinese regime based in China had ruled Taiwan in all of its history. And he ruled from 1945 right through till his death in 1975, and then his son took over and, until his death in 1988. And even though the communists took over in China, the regime itself was a colonial regime and that it was ruled by a minority of Chinese who ruled over the Taiwanese and who oppressed the Taiwanese and didn't give them any opportunities. Oh, so you know, it was only... Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, then the third, the third great period is the democratization period, which began with the presidency of Li Donghui starting in 1988. He had been the vice president under Zhang Jingguo, and he was Taiwanese, and he started a big process of, of democratization, which is continuing today. And I see that as the sort of third big historical period in Taiwan's history. Mm, mm, mm. Um, I, I wonder, uh, well, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Um, what, it, it, just sort of a, a long question, so I'd ask you just to answer it as briefly as you possibly could. Um, 
What do you think are some of the key elements um, to the character of contemporary Taiwan that these different periods of colonization have uh, added? Um, I'm not quite sure I, 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 I get the, just of, the gist of your question. Can you repeat it, please? Sure, sure. Okay, the, each of these periods of colonialization that you've mentioned, what did they leave behind? What kind of characteristics did they imprint on the face of Taiwan that we can see today? Well, I think you'd have to look at the different periods and, and sort of pick what was relevant for each one. Mm -hmm. um, so during the Manchu period, before the Dutch came, there were no Chinese living in Taiwan permanently. Taiwanese came temporarily. Some came to trade. Some came to fish. Pirates came to hide. But they were all there only temporarily. And there are other foreigners coming in and out of Taiwan, too, because Taiwan was in a, in a, in a, in a trade networks at that time. But it was only with the Dutch that Chinese were imported for labor. And it's only at that period that you start to get any Chinese community in Taiwan at all. Before the Dutch came, Taiwan was a disunited island of many Aboriginal, what we today would call Aboriginal tribes, uh, who were mainly headhunters. And so there was quite a bit of um, internecine warfare within Taiwan, you know, a lot of headhunting. So it was dangerous to go too far away from your home. But at the same time, what was interesting was many of these tribes were very egalitarian. They were very prosperous according to what the Dutch said and, and what Chinese said. Uh, some of them were uh, matrilineal as opposed to patrilineal, which was quite different from what, what came with the Chinese later. So um, they were, I guess what, what's important to point out about these colonial regimes is that even though there were Chinese migrants who came and settled in Taiwan, their identity eventually changed from a Chinese identity to a Taiwanese identity. And all of the regimes that came in... I think uh, that's a really important point right there. Yeah. And that, all of the this regimes This transformation that came in, to a Taiwan identity. Yeah. And all the regimes that came in, came in as outsiders and ruled the Taiwanese as locals. So, so the, who were Taiwanese began to change over time. Originally it was only Aborigine, later Chinese came in who became Taiwanese as well. But the regimes that were ruling them were ruling on top of them. None of, none of these local, none of the people who lived in Taiwan permanently uh, actually ruled themselves until democratization. Mm, mm, interesting. Now, um, I wonder if you've had the opportunity to talk to any mainland scholars about your research. That is, mainland scholars who specialize on Taiwan. I have talked to some. Um, it's very difficult because there's certain sort of uh, um, truths that the Chinese Communist Party has set up, and it's very hard for these people, certainly in a public setting, to say anything which differs from what they say. But what they say is very different from mm. what the historical facts show. So they say Taiwan was part of China from the year dot, and that's just patently wrong. Uh, and they say it belongs to us, which is also patently wrong. So, um, um, yeah, I have given talks in China. I was invited to give talks, and um, they've been a bit shocked by what I've said. Where, where, about, what where about did you give talks? In Beijing and in Qingdao. Okay, okay. Um, I think what, what surprised me most was that these are people who knew some of the details of what was happening in Taiwan politics. For example, that, um, that um, Chairman Ma ying the, the, who was president at the time, and Chairman of the Kuomintang had attacked the Speaker of the House. They knew that sort of thing, but they didn't know that, you know, what the Taiwan community was like when Chiang Kai-shek came. So they would ask a question was, when Chiang Kai-shek came to Taiwan, were all the people there Aborigines? That's sort of a silly question. And, yeah, that you know, so that's sort of that's basic really knowledge silly. if you're doing anything about Taiwan, but they didn't know. So, you know, there's a, a real ignorance about Taiwan. Once I was on a high-speed train to, to uh, the south in, in Taiwan, and there was a woman sitting there who turned out to be from China. And um, she kept asking me about these really right-wing conservatives who weren't very important. And I said, I, you know, I told her about all these people, but I said, why don't you ask me about the really important people in Taiwan? And she said, well, I don't know much about them because of what's in our press. It's restricted. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> you know, I gave a talk um, while I was in Taiwan. Let me see, it was in October, the last week of October. I got invited to the Taiwan Research Institute at Xiamen University. And I, I think your point of view on Taiwan and mine is probably pretty similar. And uh, so I gave them my point of view, which didn't accord with the party's point of view. And um, there's one student asked me, I, 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 I talked about the increasing sense of Taiwan identity and uh, how that's really mushroomy. And this one student, who's a, this very nice girl, says, but we're taught that we're all descendants of the Yellow Emperor. And so I don't think everybody in Taiwan quite buys that. And there was this, this look of disbelief that covered her face instantly. Mm. <laughs> No, it's, it's true that there is that problem. And uh, it, people in Taiwan, well, first of all, the people in Taiwan, um, you know, what are Chinese or Han Chinese? That's already problematic. So there have mm -hmm. been DNA studies which show that there's no, there's no DNA grouping which deals with Han Chinese. Northern Han Chinese and Southern Han Chinese are quite different. Mm -hmm. So most of the people in Taiwan would have had their background in Southern China rather than Northern China. So in that sense, they're not sort of, they're not sort of descendants of the Yellow Emperor anyway. <laughs> That's a really good point. Um, you know, your research is really interesting because, you know, when people hear about Taiwan, they automatically think that it's going to be a discussion about cross-strait relations, um, which, of course, is the focus of geostrategic interest. So that, um, I, I think that to really understand Taiwan, you have to move way beyond that. And um, some people just don't want to do that. They, they want to stop at cross-strait relations, and that's it. That's all Taiwan means to them. Well, okay, let me ask you this. Um, what's Taiwan culture? What is Chinese culture? Well, both, the, the word culture, I mean, is, has quite a, a wide range of, of ideas and, and concepts. So um, it's sort of hard to, you know, define easily what Chinese culture is and what China, and Taiwan culture is. But I think people in, and there's certainly links too, because because some of the um, people from in Taiwan have have Chinese ancestors. So in some ways, there's some links in terms of uh, language, in terms of, um, or at least adopted language, Mandarin, and in terms of marriage customs and things, there are links between them. But there's also a very strong differences in identity and, we, and we have feeling one minute of to break here, so I'll just pump that in. Yeah. So, um, um, and and of course, in Taiwan today, being democratic is a very important part of, of how people identify. Um, I think this identity issue is very important, and identity does change. So in Australia, in the 1950s, lots of Australians who were born in Australia and had never left Australia would talk about going home, and they meant they were going to Britain. But no one talks like that anymore. I mean, mm. for Australians now, home is Australia. It's not, it's not Britain or some other foreign place. And in a sense, maybe some people in Taiwan felt that they too, um, you know, originated or had some home in, in China, some idea of home. But people don't think like that in Taiwan anymore. And one of the problems that the Chinese have in understanding Taiwan is that many people in China today have what you might call a bloodline perspective of what, chi what Chinese are or who Chinese are. Uh, so um, they say, well, if your ancestors are Chinese forever, you're Chinese. And of course, that's not true. The people in Taiwan have different perspectives. People in Singapore have different perspectives. People who've moved to Malaysia from China have different perspectives. And it's just the same as the people that came from England and went to Canada, Australia, New Zealand. That's they don't really feel like point. they're British anymore. That's They've really changed. And, um, you know, the Americans, too, Americans had a revolution and had a change. So, but, um, you know, the, the Chinese changed, too. And a very good example of that was um, American Ambassador Gary Locke, who had Chinese background, but he had also right had... right up on the break here. Okay. Pardon? We're coming right up on the break. Yeah. Okay, well, let's take a break and come back to Gary Locke. Uh, okay. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, citizen journalism from Hawaii finding the intersection of our sense of place and our place in the world, right here at home. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. 
I'm Jay Fidel, host of Life After Statehood, and I do this with uh, our regular contributor, Ray Tsuchiyama, uh, and we try to make sense of all that has happened in Hawaii, all that is happening, and all that should happen. <laughs> Ray, what do you think of that show? I feel delighted to be part of Life After Statehood, since after 59, so many things happened to the state of Hawaii, yet things could have gone in other directions. And that's what I'm fascinated about, that Hawaii has had a great history, but could have an even greater future. There you go. I believe that. I'm with you all the way. Ray Tsuchiyama and me, Jay Fidel, we do it as much as we can on Life After Statehood. Come around and see what we have to say. Thanks. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Dr. J. Bruce Jacobs, a Professor Emeritus from Monash University in Australia. He's joining us via Skype from Melbourne. Our topic, Taiwan was never a part of China. Uh, pretty provocative title, but that's what we try to do here. We try to bring you provocative shows. Before the break, we were talking about what is Taiwan culture versus Chinese culture. So let's go back to that and add on a little bit more to that. Okay. Um, well, we were talking about um, the American ambassador to China, Gary Locke, right. who had been he'd been the governor of Washington State and things. And right. he went to China, and he was very confusing for the Chinese because um, he was an American, and he didn't speak much Chinese. Uh, if he did, he spoke mainly Cantonese. He looked Chinese, but he didn't act Chinese in this Chinese sense. So, for example, here he was a senior official, but he flew economy. He took his children to McDonald's in public. He carried his own bags. And all these were sort of seen by Chinese as really weird. How would a high official carry his own bags or fly economy or go to Macker's? Uh, and, you know, it was very disorienting for them because they thought, this is a guy with a Chinese face, he's Chinese. Well, he clearly wasn't. And that sort of, the key point is, you know, you might have had Chinese ancestors, but that doesn't mean you're Chinese today. Well, let me, let me ask you this question, and then I'd like to move on to some more contemporary issues. Um, looking at today's Taiwan, wh where's the balance? Um, in other words, in your view, what, what, what percentage of Taiwan culture today is Taiwanese, what is Chinese? Again, that's a very hard question to answer. That, um, that's the kind of questions we like. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, clearly the people in Taiwan value the democracy very mm -hmm. strongly. Mm -hmm. That's one, one key difference. Uh, and the Chinese don't. Um, one of the things so I was going to mention... So that's Taiwanese. We put that on the Taiwanese side of the ledger? That's the Taiwanese value their democracy, and in China they okay. may value it, but they can't say it publicly. One of the things I was going to mention before, which came up, but I forgot to mention it at the time, was that one of the things that's very confusing for Chinese scholars about Taiwan is so when they have these meetings on, from people on both sides of the straits, um, they don't understand what these changes in, in Taiwan identity mean. To them it's confusing because, as you said, they're, everyone's supposed to be the children of the Yellow Emperor. In fact, of course, the Aborigines aren't. Uh, but, but <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> they, can, they tend to forget that. And so they find that very confusing. Um, in Taiwan now, to get back to the identity issue, um, there have been a study, well, there have been a whole series of studies and surveys, but they all show the same thing, which is that Taiwan identity is increasing. And there's a really important... Um, survey done by an academic institution, and it asks, are you Chinese, are you Taiwanese, or are you both? And this has been done every six months since 1992. Originally, Taiwanese were about one in six. Now Taiwanese are over 60%, only Taiwanese. And the number that are only Chinese used to be about one in four, and now it's down to about two or three percent. So you can see there's been a very, very important change in this in, in Taiwan identity in Taiwan. And what's even more important is that the, this Taiwan identity is even stronger among young people. So and, and the this, people who have a Chinese identity are the old ones who, you like you and me, won't be around for very long. And it's the young people who, who have even stronger Taiwan identity. So this isn't going to change. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm a permanent 25, so... Um. Okay, I'm so pleased to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I mean, actually, this has, uh, when we think about it, this has geostrategic um, ramifications, too, doesn't it? I mean, it says that if there's the increasing sense of 
Taiwaneseness, then probably these folks don't want to be part of China. Exactly. And what's more important is we tend to, people in Taiwan too sometimes talk about Taiwan being tiny or small. Taiwan is not tiny or small. Taiwan is a middle power. It's got a population the same size of Australia, as Australia, about 24 million people, which means its population is bigger than three quarters of the world's nations. It's got an area which is bigger than two fifths of the world's nations. It has a very developed economy. It has high educational standards. It's got a very substantial military. So Taiwan is a middle power power. It isn't just something tiny that can be tossed away. So you've got 24 million people who value their democracy and who don't want to be part of China. And I think it's really important that the nations of the world recognize this. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And it, 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 it displeases me that so many uh, countries are sort of willing to throw Taiwan under the bus because they think they'll get a better financial deal from China. Uh, it's refreshing that two of Taiwan's uh, two, Taiwan's two remaining uh, allies in uh, uh, Africa, uh, Burkina Faso and Swaziland, despite all these overtures by China, have, re have decided to stay with Taiwan, which I, I, I found refreshing. Um, Can I just... Um Sure. I, I think I think it's really important not to concentrate on the official allies that Taiwan has. They're 20, 21, I think now, or 20, uh, including the Vatican. Um, but these aren't the important foreign relations for Taiwan. The important foreign relations are with the big democratic powers. So the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, India, uh, all the European powers. No, I would and agree the with you on community. that. I would agree with you. And these. These, these nations all have offices in, in Taiwan, which are staffed by, by foreign affairs officials. The, to become head of the, the, which is called representative in Taiwan, is actually the ambassador. These are prestigious positions and highly sought after in all these countries. And Taiwan, too, has its uh, foreign relations people outside. They're foreign service people in all of these other countries. And they have offices which have diplomatic privileges, like diplomatic bag. They have tax privileges. They have some uh, relief from uh, uh, judicial uh, charges. Uh, these are typical diplomatic privileges. And so what you have, even though these countries won't admit it, you actually have one China, one Taiwan policy <laughs> of all countries. Good and, point. and more and more, and these countries by and large have said they recognize, they understand that China claims Taiwan, but they don't accept that. They don't, they don't recognize it. Right. Uh, and, 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 and the problem was that all these countries set up their relations with China when Jiang Kai-shek and Jiang Jingguo <coughs> were still in power. So Jiang Kai-shek and Jiang Jingguo insisted that Taiwan belonged to China, but they weren't democratic and they weren't representing the people of Taiwan. So I think it's really important now that these countries realize that the situation is drastically different because Taiwan is democratized. Right. And it's now run by its own people, not being run by outsiders. Uh, and to me, that's that's critical. Uh, and I think, you know, under the circumstances, it's working reasonably well, this sort of model uh, where you have a an understood one China, one Taiwan policy, uh, even though you don't declare it out loud. Good. Well, let's, um, we have about seven minutes left in the show. Um, let's move on to some real contemporary issues. Uh, Tsai Ing-wen, how's she doing? Um, I think a lot of people in Taiwan are, uh, who support the Democratic Progressive Party are a bit disappointed. There have been some poor, um, some poor appointments made that haven't worked out very well. Um, on the other hand, um, I think generally, um, certainly the Aboriginal population appreciated the fact that she made the apology uh, to the Aborigines, even though um, it perhaps didn't get the sort of press that would have been desirable in Taiwan at the time. And um, there's still some racism against Aborigines in Taiwan. Mm. Um, so I think she's making some progress. Um, I, th I think there's a feeling, though, that it's been a bit faltering and hopefully will work a bit better as time moves on. Okay, prediction. Will she be reelected in 2020? Oh, uh, that's still three years away, so I think um, it's probably, but uh, we'll have to see. <laughs> okay. I mean, how long? I mean, let's just 
to take another example, who would have predicted even a few months ago that Donald Trump would be president of the United States right now? Good point. Uh, Good point. Let, let alone three or four years down the track. Good point. Good point. Um, what do you see as size biggest challenges? Well, there's domestic challenges and there's international challenges. Okay, so let's, I think let's look at each. Okay, well, the international, the big international challenge, of course, is China. Okay. Uh, and um, the Chinese are sort of saying, well, you don't agree with us, and therefore we're not going to do this, we're not going to send tourists, we're not going to do this, and we're not going to do that, we're going to make life hard for you. Um, I don't think she really cares about that, uh, but, but it is a challenge, and um, it, it's a difficulty that that the people in Taiwan have to deal with. Domestically, I think the critical issues are to keep the economy going, to um, make sure that employment doesn't decline. Down to two minutes, Bruce. Two minutes? Yeah, down to two okay. minutes. Okay, well, I think um, those are the key issues in terms of uh, the domestic issues. Uh, try to make sure that the welfare system works. Try to rejig the pension system so the country doesn't go broke. Um, those are the key issues there. Fix the medical system a bit. Uh, that's pretty good. That that's pretty good. So, those are the basic issues that are facing her and and Taiwan as a whole. Um, we probably have but, about a minute left here, but uh, let me pump in this question: um, Do you think that uh, Taiwan voters are a bit unreasonable? No, I think they're very bright and very clear uh, what they want, uh, and I think one can easily understand why they have voted as they have in the past. And the reason I ask that is it seems that they have such a short pa um, a span of patience and they want instantaneous results to very complex questions and situations. I don't think that's entirely correct. Okay. Um, and uh, I think if you look at the past elections, you can understand how they voted and why they did. Um, Okay. I hope that's within a minute. I hope that's a good day. Okay, I think we're doing pretty well. Um, Zori, how much time do we have left? How, how much? Oh, we're down to, we have one minute at this point. Oh, okay. 45 seconds now. Uh, well, do you have any uh, concluding comments that you would like to um, share with us in our, I guess we're down to about 30 seconds now. Well, I think just to sort of summarize, I think Taiwan has been separate. Um, the, during the Aboriginal period before the Dutch came, the uh, trading was mainly with Southeast Asia rather than with, and it wasn't with China. Uh, and um, overall, Taiwan has been built as a non-Chinese place for a long period of time. The, uh, it was only with Chiang Kai-shek that a Chinese ruler based in China uh, ruled Taiwan for the first time in 1945. Great. Great. Well, I want to thank Professor Jacobs for joining us today. Uh, he has a pro reputation for offering provocative ideas, and as such, he's given us a lot to think about. And thank you for joining us today. Our guest next week will be Russell Xiao, who heads up the new Washington, D.C.-based Global Taiwan Institute. So join us then, and thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. Bruce, are thank you still there? Yeah. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. I think uh, I think it came across really well. And uh, we should be sending you the link.